Hi guys, welcome to lab number two. In this lab, we'll start drawing our first schematic geological cross sections, having a look at what horizontally bedded rocks and vertical features, what they look like on maps and how they look on cross sections. And in this lab, we have um, a sheet of questions which ask you questions about um, the orientation of, of beds and other geological features, working out from the scale on the map how wide geological features are and how thick they are, and then using a geological cross-section and a map to reconstruct a stratigraphic column for an area. So that's the question sheet and you have been given a partially completed map and a hill profile panel that you can draw a cross-section on. Okay, so question one then says that the map overleaf, overleaf sorry, shows a sequence of sedimentary rocks which have been intruded by dolerite dikes which have been labelled D from the relationship between the contacts between the different sedimentary rocks and the topography what can you deduce about the orientation or the dip of the sedimentary rocks and what is your evidence okay well as we saw in lecture whenever you get this sort of outcrop pattern where the outcrops the borders between them the contacts between them whenever they are perfectly parallel to the ground contours you can only get that sort of relationship when the rocks are horizontally bedded and it makes perfect sense if, if the, you have a boundary between an oolitic limestone and a sandstone which crops out perfectly horizontally everywhere along the same topographic height then the bedding or the, the sedimentary rocks they themselves must be horizontally bedded so our outcrop pattern shows that the sedimentary rocks are uh, the contacts between them are parallel to the ground contours and this means that they must be horizontally bedded the second question says from the relationship between the contacts of the dikes and the topography what can you deduce about the orientation or dips of the dikes what is your evidence well what you can see our dolerite dike this this red feature labeled D you can see that it cuts across the ground contours without being deflected it's a perfectly linear straight feature on the map and the only way that you can get an outcrop pattern like like this over an undulating or hilly topography is if that feature is perfectly vertical. So our evidence is that the dike, the, the contacts of the dike are perfectly straight. They aren't deflected by any of the contours as it as that dike trends across the landscape. And you can only get that outcrop pattern if the dike was vertical. Okay, next question is asking how wide the dike is at point X. Well, in order to work that out, we need to work out what the scale of the map is. And in the bottom corner of the map, you can see that we've been given a scale bar. And when we take a ruler to that scale bar, we see that that 100 meters represented by the scale bar is equal to 20 millimeters. So 20 millimeters on the map is equal to 100 meters in real life so to work out how much one millimeter is we divide that 100 meter length of the of the scale bar by 20 to give us one millimeter equals five meters that's our scale factor then to work out the width of things like dikes we take the thickness perpendicular to the contacts and we see that on our map the width of the dike is about five millimeters so we take that five millimeters and multiply it by our scale factor and shows that our five millimeter dike is actually 25 meters wide in real life
Next question asks us what the true thickness is of the oolite. We can see the oolite is this unit that's in this sort of purplish colour. And you can see that the top contact, the highest up contact of the oolite, crops out continuously at 700 metres. And the lower contact, the base of that oolite, crops out continuously at 600 metres. Now if the oolite is horizontally bedded, which we can tell that it is from its outcrop pattern on the map, then we can work out that the thickness of the oolite is the height of that top contact 700, take away the height of the bottom contact 600 to give us a thickness of 100 metres. Okay, the next question says that based on the outcrop patterns you have, complete the blank areas of the map to show the rocks most likely to be present across the area. Well, we've already worked out that the sedimentary rocks appear to be horizontal. And so if they're horizontal across the area, which is an assumption that we're going to make, those contacts and those rocks should crop out at the same topographic heights everywhere. The second thing we've already understood is that the dike is a vertical feature. And because it's vertical, its orientation in the landscape won't change as it travels across that undulating topography. And we've worked out, or it should be apparent to us, that that dike is the youngest feature of the geology. It cuts across all of the other rocks. And if it's done that, then those rocks must have already existed in order for that dike to cut through them. So what we can end up doing is drawing the dike first and those horizontally bedded rocks to show where else they'd appear on the landscape. And hopefully your completed map should look something like this. Okay, the next question asked to, in the space below, draw a cross section between A and B. So we want to show the subsurface geology between those two points, showing the topography and the rock types that we'd find at depth. So the first thing that we do is take our strip of paper, our cross section strip, and we mark along the start and end of our cross section and then mark on everywhere that we cross one of these contours. So here we've crossed the 800 meter contour, here the 700, and I've marked on those positions on my strip. Then what I can do is move my strip of paper to my cross section panel and line up the ends of it, A and B. And then simply like we did last week, transfer from the strip onto that cross section panel the heights of the contours that we crossed. So when I put my strip of paper along the geological map at this point I crossed the 800 so on my cross panel uh, on my cross section panel I mark on a point at 800 meters. I do that for all of the other ground contours that I cross and then I join the points together with a line that represents the hill profile. So I'm going to have to estimate where the tops of, or the brows of the hills along my um, cross section would be. But hopefully you can see that by joining those points in that landscape, we get a, a realistic looking hill profile. Then what I can do is take my strip of paper back to the cross section, uh, back to the map rather, and then mark along it everywhere that I cross a geological contact. And if you guys um, prefer to work in color like me, then you can, you can shade the top part of that strip in the appropriate color for the rock type, or you can write it down, whichever works for you. I just find that color works best for me. 
Then I take that strip of paper and put it back onto my newly completed hill profile. And then everywhere that I've hit a change in rock type, a, a stratigraphic contact, I mark on the hill profile where that stratigraphic contact would crop out on the hill. So for example, on my strip of paper, I've got a contact um, between my blue unit and my yellow unit that crops out about here. So I mark that directly onto the hill profile. Then what I find often helps me um, to, to start visualizing the geology is transfer that rock information. So the different rock types along my strip of paper as a very thin veneer onto the hill profile using the appropriate colors. Okay, so that way, at least what I know is that if I were to be walking along this hill profile, then these are the points at which I'd, I'd be traveling in different rock types. Okay, now what I have to start doing is drawing the subsurface geology onto my hill profile. And to avoid me having to rub things out too much, I start drawing on the, the contacts, starting with the youngest one first. So I know from the cross-cutting relationships that the dike is the youngest rock type in the area. It cuts across the rest of the stratigraphy. So I can plot my dike, my vertical dike, straight onto the hill profile. And after I've plotted the contact of my dike, I can plot on the horizontally bedded sedimentary rocks, the older material which has been cross-cut by the dike. Then what I can do is apply some of the colour that was used on the map onto my um, cross-section in order to show the subsurface geology. So your cross-section should end up looking something a bit like that. Now the next question is asking you in the space provided to construct a stratigraphic column for the area showing the relative thickness of the rocks in stratigraphic order. Okay, well, luckily this cross-section has already given you a scale. So it's already told you uh, both the relative thicknesses and the absolute thicknesses of the rocks. So that's one job done. And hopefully you guys remember something called the law of superposi superposition, which says that rocks are layered in a sequence, or they're deposited in a sequence, with the oldest in that sequence deposited first and at the bottom of the sequence. So in order to build ourselves a stratigraphic column for this area, we can simply represent the stratigraphy that we've drawn in our cross section as a column showing the order of uh, deposition of our rocks and the relative and absolute thicknesses of them. So that's the end of the lab. It's a very rudimentary example into um, how to draw horizontal and vertically in place rocks onto a geological cross section. And if you're happy with this, then we can move on to lab number three where we look at our first real geological map. Okay, thanks guys. See you next time.